Uh, so hi, everybody. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this. It's been really fun so far. Um, we've had a bunch of um, really interesting um, science talks about human speech processing. And I guess we're going to go back to machine speech processing for a little while. Um, so this talk is about um, representations of spoken words and how we can learn them uh, from data. Um, and so this is something that I've started to work on recently with a bunch of collaborators, both at TTI and outside of TTI. And it's been a really fun playground uh, to play on. So I'll, I'll show you a little bit of what we've, what we've done so far. Um, so um, anybody who is in natural language processing or text processing knows word embeddings in the sense of textual word embeddings. Um, so word embeddings have pretty much taken NLP by storm. They're ubiquitous in almost any um, NLP application from machine translation to parsing to part of speech tagging and so on. Um, and the idea in textual word embeddings is that a written word can be represented as a vector in some continuous d-dimensional vector space. Um, and the idea or the goal typically in textual word embeddings is that we want words that are semantically similar to end up having uh, vectors that are close together. Um, and there's a bunch of techniques for learning these um, word embeddings automatically from data, like latent semantic analysis, word to vec, glove. These are some of the popular ones these days. Um, and here's an example of just a small set of uh, semantic word embeddings. And these are words that are related to criminal justice. Um, so you can see how the semantic similarity thing works. So uh, over here we have a bunch of words that are related to uh, crime scenes. Um, here we have words that are related to courtrooms, a few words that describe lawyers, and so on. Um, and so what we're interested in is kind of doing the same thing for spoken words, um, but the motivation is a little bit different. Um, so what we mean by acoustic word embeddings is taking a spoken word, so a signal, a segment of speech corresponding to a word, and embedding it uh, with some function into a d-dimensional vector space. Um, so taking this arbitrary duration thing and mapping it into a fixed dimensional space. Um, and here we'd like for similar uh, or for same word segments to end up having very close together vectors. So ideally, all of the signals that correspond to the same word should have a very tight cluster in the space. And then perhaps we would also like similar sounding words to have clusters that are close together. So that's kind of like what we're, what we're aiming for here. Um, now, why would we want to do this? Um, so I mean, there are a lot, of, a lot of reasons why we might want to represent words this way. Um, but we're mainly um, motivated by a bunch of speech processing tasks that all have as a subroutine the need to measure distances between speech segments at some point. Okay, and some examples of tasks where, um, where this comes up naturally are like query by example search, spoken term discovery, and some approaches to speech recognition that involve dealing with whole words at a time, like template-based speech recognition. Um, and so for example, in spoken term discovery, the task is we're given um, some pile of speech, so just the black stuff, not the boxes. And our task is to basically find the boxes and color them, so discover that this is a word or a term, this is a term, this is a term, and so on. And these three boxes are three examples of the same term, and these two blue boxes are the same term, and so on. Um, so this is something like what perhaps a, a child does when they learn language and what we might need to do when we're uh, dealing with speech processing in a new language. Um, another task that motivates a lot of what we're doing is query by example search. So here, again, we have a big database of recorded speech, and we have a query, a word or, or a multi-word term that we're looking for in this database. And our task is to find the locations where we believe this query occurs, if at all, um, in the database. Um, and so we'll use a, a task that's related to this in all of the experiments um, that I'll show later. Um, so the traditional approach to query by example search is based on dynamic time warping. 
uh, or DTW. So the idea is for every frame in the spoken query and for every frame in the database, we have a distance measure. So you can think of blue here as being very, um, very big distance and red being very low distance, so very similar frames. Um, and then dynamic time warping just means we're going to do some kind of dynamic programming search through this big matrix of distances and we're going to look for approximately diagonal segments which mean that these are portions of high similarity between the query and the database. Um, and those will be our putative hits. Um, the problem with this standard way of doing it is that first dynamic time warping can be slow. Um, and more importantly for us, it can be hard to improve it. We'd like to be able to apply machine learning techniques to um, automatically learn how to do this task. And it's kind of hard. There's not a lot to learn about dynamic time warping. Um, on the other hand, if we can represent things in terms of fixed dimensional vectors, machine learning knows really well how to deal with fixed dimensional vectors. Um, so the approach that we have in mind is that what we'll do is we'll take the query, we'll embed it into a vector, and then we'll take the database, take all of the possible segments in the database, embed them all. So now we have a pile of vectors here and one vector here, and we'll basically look for nearest neighbors, and those will be our putative hits. David, yes? When you say that from how about learning about the distance? Yes, so that's the one thing we can learn. Okay. Um, so people do do that. They'll learn this. Um, so the mapping from query frame and, and database frame to a distance. But then those all get combined together um, and it's not obvious how to learn end to end. I agree with your statement that we can use GTW or something equivalent by machine learning. I could easily imagine uh, a recurrent net that reads the query and then another one just scans the other thing and outputs a peak when it finds it and it could train it with lots and lots of uh, data. Uh, it could That's not it unlike what we're going to do, but I wouldn't call that dynamic time warping. But, but yeah, because uh, it has to have the right alignment, you have to write, have the right segment, and it's not clear if your segments are too small or too large. Whereas if you let some model figure out how to deal with that uh, fuzzy thing, uh, it might work better. Right. I, I guess I just wouldn't call that dynamic time warping. I'm maybe being a little bit narrow about what I call dynamic time warping. So I'm talking about specifically where we have a function for just frame distances and then we're going to do dynamic time warping, um, and we're, then we're going to do dynamic programming over that. And that's kind of like the traditional way that people approach query dynamic time warping. Um, and there might be like a number of other ways of doing it, um, but basically, yeah, one of the ways we'll do it is we'll run it. Okay. Yes? The hard part is That's, that's right. Yeah, so I've, I'm kind of going to gloss over this part for the purposes of this talk. So what we'll do is not quite the query by example task. We'll do a proxy task where we're just trying to determine for two segments whether they're the same or different. Um, but yeah, in the long run, um, we'd like to have something that also will, will take segmentation as part of the learnable model. OK. Um, so hopefully the setup is clear, um, or at least where we think this is going to fit in is clear. And again, this is just one application, but there's a bunch of other ones where we might want to compute distances. Um, so our first approach when we started doing this was, well, why don't we um, represent a word in terms of how close it is to a bunch of other words? <laughs> Um, and so our first approach uh, at an acoustic word embedding is a list of DTW distances between our word segment Y and a bunch of reference word segments R1 through RM. Um, and so this is a, a long vector of, of similarities or distances and it basically says that the way I represent a word is just how, how similar it is to other words. And then we reduce dimensionality, and we can do that in a bunch of different ways um, in this work. We happen to use Laplacian eigenmaps um, because Aaron Jansen is the author. Uh, <laughs> um, OK. Uh, and then, so here's our first attempt at a task. So like I said, we're going to do a, a, a kind of proxy task for query by example. So this is a same different 
uh, decision task where we're given a whole bunch of pairs of word segments and we're just going to say same or different uh, for each pair. Um, and then we're going to measure our performance in terms of a standard detection or binary classification performance measure, which is average precision. So we'll take um, the distances that we measure between the pairs, we'll threshold them with some threshold, and as we sweep that threshold, we'll get different precision, uh, precisions and recalls, and we'll measure the average precision over that whole curve. So we want higher numbers, and the highest that we can get is one. Um, okay, uh, and we, uh, we train, we do our training on a uh, 10,000 word set uh, from the switchboard conversational speech database. So these are excised words out of conversations. Um, and then we have similar size development and test sets, um, which amounts to roughly 60 million pairs uh, that we do for it. And then we use cosine distance between the embeddings of the words. Um, OK, so this um, first attempt in an acoustic word embedding um, has an average precision of uh, about 0.365, and you can compare that to kind of just basic baseline DTW applied to a bunch of standard speech representations, PLPs, MFCCs, and FDLTs. You all get around 0.2. Uh, um, so already we're doing a little bit better than, than plain DTW. Um, and it's not obvious that this proxy task is a good <laughs> proxy task, but um, in later work, um, Levin et al. took these representations and applied them in an actual query by example task and showed that it still does better than a standard uh, query by example DTW based uh, system. So even though we only looked at real word segments and didn't deal with the segmentation problem, they just applied the exact same embedding to both real word segments and non-word segments. Okay. Um, okay, so then we, um, we took a little break, and then we came back to this um, uh, all energized with deep learning, and we said um, we really ought to be able to do this um, with some kind of deep network, so why don't we try to represent a word um, using a word classifier? So we took a, a convolutional neural network classifier, um, and its outputs are basically a vector of probabilities posterior probabilities of each word in some dictionary. Um, and so now we're representing each word as how likely it is to be recognized as every other word in the dictionary. Um, so, that's, um, so that's our next attempt. The other kind of variant of this is we could add another uh, narrower bottleneck layer here and use that as our embedding. So that's a nice, easy way of uh, playing with the dimensionality of the embedding. No, not as, no. Um, so we, um, we used a, approximately a 1,000 word dictionary. Yeah, yeah, so I mean words that are not in the dictionary, they'll just presumably have more higher entropy posterior distribution. Um, okay, and this turns out to do a lot better than the reference vectors. So the classifier, the plain classifier model, as an average precision of over 0.5. If we want to reduce the dimensionality and use a bottleneck layer, um, we lose a little bit of, of precision, but we also um, reduce the dimensionality by a lot. Um, yes? So is the same as trained in some kind of supervised fashion? Yes. So this okay. is a supervised so that's setting. very different from the prior. Yes. Okay. yes. Um, so, right, so now we were interested to know, um, we had kind of two concerns about this classifier-based representation. One is, um, like Jim was asking, it requires hard supervision. Um, and the other one is that it's not clear what happens to words that are in the classifier's vocabulary versus words that are out. So I'm not sure how clear this is back there, but what, what I'm showing here is um, each row here is an embedding of a word segment. So these happen to be 128 dimensional embedding vectors. And then there's a bunch of rows corresponding to the word absolutely, a bunch of doctor, doctors, particular, particularly quality, and recycling. Um, and what happens here is many of the words occur in the training set, but a few of them don't. So recycling does, and it has nice kind of consistent uh, vectors. Um, on the other hand, uh, particularly in quality, don't. 
Um, and so they tend to have kind of noisier vectors. Um, and we didn't really like that there's this kind of asymmetry between words that do occur in training and words that don't occur in training. Um, so our next attempt was to say, well, why don't we forget about hard labeling and forget about training a classifier and instead um, just use a kind of weak supervision where we just have a bunch of pairs of training segments and just same or different labels on those pairs. Yes? Supervised part, I think like uh, by, by Jim and Manuel as well, on, on using a segmental TCW and kind of discovering some yeah, form of like noisy uh, word assignments. And then right, right. I think Manuel and then did, try to classify did, those. Um, actually use these ones as labels to yeah. train a neural network. Yeah. And they found that by doing this, like you're kind of discovering these noisy labels, train a neural network, make a huge improvement, and still it's completely unsupervised. Yes, we should look into that. <laughs> yeah. For yeah, word yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was. Uh, he can speak better. Okay. Yeah, I think he's, he's like some paper that I read from, from your group. Okay, we'll talk. Um, so in the in the weaker supervision case, we're just given same or different labels. Um, and the nice thing about this situation is it's kind of more like the task that we actually care about, where we're really in the end only going to care about is making decisions like that, uh, same different decisions. So we're going to train these um, as Siamese networks. So this is a term for, um, there's really only one network, there's not two networks, um, but in training we copy it uh, twice, uh, once for each element of the pair, and then the loss is related to some kind of distance or similarity between the output layers of these networks. Um, and now the output layers um, have no meaning, they're not posteriors or anything like that. So there's no probability distribution here. Some continuous valued vector, yeah. Um, and we're going to measure cosine distance between the embeddings of the two words in the pair, and then we have a loss based on that distance. Okay. Uh, so in our case, we use um, a contrastive loss. There are a number of different kinds of losses that you could use here. Um, so it's a margin-based loss. So we measure the cosine distance between true pairs, x1 and x2. And then for each pair in the training set, we also randomly draw a distractor. So x3 is uh, an example of a word that is assumed to not be. Uh, the same as x1 and x2. In practice, we just draw it randomly, and in the vast majority of cases, it really will not be the same word. Um, and then our loss is trying to keep this difference in distances between true pairs and false pairs um, bigger than some margin m. So m is a tuning parameter here. So this is a typical hinge-based loss. It's a cosine distance. So, okay, yes, I forgot to mention when we were here. So this is the cosine distance. So it's one minus uh -huh. okay. the cosine okay. between the two okay. vectors. Okay. Um, and how do the Siamese networks do? Um, so pretty similarly to the classifiers, a little bit better though. Um, and they tend to suffer less at lower dimensionalities than the classifier networks. Um, I don't have much more to say about that. Um, yes. Okay. Um, so another thing we can do is ra rather than a convolutional neural network, something which might be more natural for um, dynamically varying uh, duration segments is recurrent neural networks. Um, so here we happen to be using LSTM uh, recurrent neural networks, um, but we've we've played around with various uh, various kinds. So the idea here is for every frame, I have uh, multi uh, some number of stacked layers of RNN, um, and then I could use the final hidden state vector as the embedding of the word, or I could pass that through an additional few fully connected layers. 
um, and then have that final thing be the preferred embedding for this uh, segment. Okay. And then I could use this RNN everywhere where I was previously using the CNN. It could be a classifier or it could be used as a, in a Siamese network uh, training setup. Um, and the other fun thing that we can do now is if we do have supervision, then we could consider jointly learning both acoustic word embeddings with one RNN and the corresponding embedding of the corresponding character sequence with another RNN. Um, so that's kind of another, um, a third form, uh, a third way of, of learning RNN embedding. So here, um, the other RNN takes in the input character sequence encoded as one hot vectors um, and then passes that through some character embedding layer and again, uh, passes it through a couple of stacked layers of RNN, some feed-forward fully connected layers, and we get a, a character sequence embedding. Um, and that's really fun because then you can compare character sequences to acoustic embeddings and, and they should end up in the same space. Um, okay, uh, now if we do this multi-view uh, setup, we have some choices in the loss function. Um, so one thing we could do is um, kind of a, something very similar to the Siamese loss that we had before, where now we're looking at the difference in <coughs> cosine distance between the true acoustic sequence X and the corresponding character sequence minus the distance between X and some other character sequence, um, not the true label. Um, but we could also do it a different way. Um, in the second term, we could instead have the true character sequence versus some other character sequence, or perhaps the true character sequence versus some other acoustic sequence, or just another pair of acoustic sequences, or perhaps we could take a weighted combination of all losses. Um, and so we've tried, we've played around with these, uh, with these loss combinations. Um, and the other interesting thing that, uh, that we can do is we can, um, move away from this margin just being a fixed parameter to being sensitive to the actual distance between the words, between the character sequences. So for example, we can measure the edit distance. Uh, here we can measure the edit distance between C and C minus, and that can form our margin. So for words that are less similar, we'd like their embeddings to be even farther apart than for words that are, that are more similar. Uh, okay, um, so now we can uh, do some fun uh, visualization. Um, so these are, um, so typically we learn pretty high dimensional embedding, something around between 100 and 1,000 dimensions, but then we can uh, visualize it uh, with a visualization tool. So here we're using a two-dimensional visualization based on TSNE. Um, so all that's trying to do is to just keep neighbors close together um, in a two-dimensional representation. And then what I'm showing here is um, each dot corresponds to a acoustic embedding of a spoken word. And then the text sequences, the beginning of every character sequence corresponds to the embedding of that character sequence. So you can see that for the most part, the embedded character sequences do end up falling on top of the corresponding cluster of acoustic segment embeddings. Um, what else? And the capital, okay, so the capitalized ones correspond to words that we have not seen in training, and the ones are ones that we have seen in training. Um, so the nice thing here is there really isn't that big of a difference, or not really detectable by us visually, between words that we have seen in training and words that we haven't, uh, which kind of makes sense because um, we're hopefully learning a much richer function of character sequences and not just like word classes. Um, some words, of course, are going to be more diffuse than others. So like the, the word something tends to get pronounced in a much wider variety of ways um, than some other words. So we get this very, very kind of uh, 
stretched out cluster, whereas the other ones are much tighter. Each of these clusters is at least 15 examples. So some of them are really very, very tight clusters. I am missing a meeting. Priorities. <laughs> um, OK. Yes. How, how, how do they compare the supervised ones and CMEs ones versus the unsupervised ones? Um, so how does this compare to the Siamese? Have some sort of a cluster, maybe it's not Oh, yes, yes. So actually, um, so to be honest, um, they all look really good to me when we just visualize them this way. I like to visualize these because then I could put the character sequence on top of the acoustic embeddings and, and, and have a really nice uh, visualization. But they actually all look really quite nice. Um, the one thing that we did notice is the classifier do tend to have kind of worse behavior with words that we haven't seen in training. Not, not too surprising. OK, but in terms of, oh, we'll get back to numerical performance. <laughs> um, one more visualization that is interesting now that we have character sequence embeddings is we can check whether um, we've satisfied this property that we were hoping for where similar character sequences will also end up being closer together than less similar ones. Um, so what we're doing, what I'm showing here, is just the character sequence embeddings um, for three types of words. So in red is all the words that end in ing, in green is all the words that end in shun, and in blue is all the words that end in li. And so all I really wanted to get out of this is that words that have similar suffix, words that have the same suffix should be closer together than words that have than words that have different suffixes. If we had a larger training set with a larger variety of words, then we could also look for much kind of finer nuances of character sequence differences. Um, but for now, we're just happy that we're getting this kind of clustering uh, effect. OK, so how do these do numerically? Um, so in general, the RNN-based embeddings do do better than, um, than the others. Um, and the multi-view ones do way better. Um, so at this point, once we get to 0.8 average precision out of one on this task, um, I'm not sure how much, how much better we can get. Um, <laughs> these are, remember, these are words that are just excised out of running conversation. So some of them are truly challenging uh, distinctions to make. Um, so at this point, we're basically um, starting to do um, downstream tasks. Uh, real search tasks. Um, OK, another fun thing that we can do with the multi-view embeddings um, is there are d other kinds of tasks that we can consider. Um, so for example, since character sequences and acoustic sequences are now embedded in the same space, we can do cross-view uh, word discrimination or cross-view retrieval. So we tried taking our word discrimination task and placing each uh, one word out of each pair with its character sequence. And now we're doing the cross-view task of saying whether this character sequence matches the acoustic sequence. So now it's basically like a, a speech recognition task or like a spoken term detection task. And we don't really have a basis for comparison here, but I can tell you that the average precision on that task is 0.89, which means, roughly speaking, that if you have a choice to search in a database using the text, or using the, uh, a corresponding acoustic sequence, um, you're better off having a, a, a multi-view embedding and using the text. Um, so right now what we're looking at is applying these embeddings to both uh, spoken term detection with textual queries and query by example, and seeing if we can use the same, the same embeddings to do both. Um, the other thing we were curious to see, yes? So could it be because the information which isn't about the word itself, and so that's, hurts the search. I think that's quite likely. Yeah, so like we haven't gotten rid of all of the nuisance parameters. Dialect, whatever. Um, yeah, so we were curious to know how well the um, embeddings that we learn with the cost sensitive margin, the margin that's sensitive to the actual edit distance between the character sequences, how well that correlates to the true uh, 
instance versus just using the fixed margin. So we tried training these embeddings with the fixed margin, with the cost sensitive margin, and then we looked at the rank correlation between the acoustic distances and true edit distances, and as well as the distances between the orthographic embeddings and the true edit distances. That was, that's clear. Um, and the main takeaway is we do do quite a lot better when we use the cost sensitive margin. Um, so if we do care about related words or unrelated words ending up in the right parts of the space, then that's a very effective uh, way to do that at training time. Um, okay, so there's been a bit of related work um, using acoustic word embeddings for various tasks. Um, a, a task very similar to ours. A um, little bit of work on speech recognition. This is the other Bengio. Um, as well as on query by example search and keyword search. So I think, I think the closest work to ours right now is this work from IBM that's going to appear at ICASP um, where they've got an, an embedding of, the, of an acoustic and an embedding of a character sequence, and they're really trying to just find uh, which ones match and which ones don't match. Um, but there are some differences in how they're trained. They're not trained jointly and so on. OK. Um, and so I'll summarize with just a few, um, few words about what we're doing now. Um, so first of all, we've, we've introduced a few different types of acoustic word embedding approaches. Um, we've found that they do outperform DTW on word discrimination. We're currently working on end-to-end -end search. And then kind of farther down the line, we're really interested in kind of digging down into the words. And you know, so far, we've just like the lowest hanging fruit. Just take a, take a word and just embed the whole thing uh, through some neural network. But we know that there is subword structure and that that subword structure is shared across words. So we're very curious to know whether we can take advantage of that hierarchy somehow um, and learn hierarchical embeddings that also embed phonemes or morphemes or whatever. Um, and then the other thing that we're really curious about um, and we want to talk to NLP people about is if we think about um, visualizations like this, um, it's interesting to think about the fact that words that end up close together um, are close together because they're acoustically similar and orthographically similar, but sometimes that also has to do with semantic similarity. So you know, the fact that all of these suffixes are the same also tells us something about the meaning of the word. And so we've started to wonder whether we could potentially learn some embeddings that are aware of both the way a word sounds and uh, the semantics of the word. Um, and so that's something that we're hoping to do. Yes? So we did experiments which we didn't publish because we failed. <laughs> Trying to map from uh, uh, the graphic embeddings to uh, semantic embeddings. Uh, it's very difficult because it's a highly nonlinear mapping. You change one letter and it's a totally different meaning. So I'm not saying it's not feasible, I'm just saying it's hard. Uh, maybe instead of learning a joint presentation might be better uh, to try to map, but maybe you're saying it makes more sense. Yeah, so one thing that we're trying now which is related to what, what Jim's group's been doing that I guess he'll talk about tomorrow is to use visual signals as a way of kind of grounding that. Um, but yeah, there are a number of different ways so that we can imagine doing it. In a, in a language model where you, you map a symbol for the word to this word embedding, you're using a table, which is like a lookup table that says, well, for this sequence of characters, this is the meaning yeah. as represented by a and so it's a very high capacity mapping. It's hard to emulate something like this with a map. You can, but it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're kind of imagining something like the character based embeddings that people have started using, but like, yeah, training it in a, in a way that it has both acoustic data as well as perhaps ling more linguistic context and perhaps image context as well. Isn't that my impression was that just with acoustics you did pretty well? Um, so we did pretty well at the acoustic task. 
But this is really, um, this is kind of suggestive here that we might be able to do semantics, but these clusters are very, very diffuse. And we really don't get much more than just this like clustering of suffixes. What we'd really like to get, you know, much more, uh, so, so much say, more semantic so information. You say that the LSTM technique uh, is not sensitive enough just to use it on the acoustics. It's not sensitive, well, as we've trained it, it's not sensitive enough to semantics. So if we'd like the same embedding to be able to do both acoustics and semantics, we really no, haven't done anything to... For example, you have, you know, we used in coding the DRT, you know, set of minimal pairs. So what if you will train it just on, I don't know, 200 words that are all minimal pairs? Will it be able to distinguish between both and both? Minimal acoustic pairs? Yeah. Um, Yeah, so if we have enough examples of those pairs, why not? Um, honestly, we were pretty impressed with how well it did with so little data. This is really not a lot of speech data at all. Um, so I guess this is one more example of deep networks kind of surprising us with how much they learn from a small amount of data. Um, yes? Uh, me wants to push you a little bit on what it would mean to have a space that includes both uh, acoustic similarity and semantic similarity within the same space. Uh, so maybe you can. Okay, say so more on that. that. So okay, so I imagine that what would happen is if we really wanted a uh, a word to have an embedding that um, that encoded both the semantics and the acoustics, probably some part of that embedding would be just acoustically related, and part of it would be just semantically related, but part of it would be overlapping. So things like morphemes that sound alike and encode some semantics. Um, and in some languages, there would be a lot more of that overlap between semantics and surface form and acoustics than in English. So that's basically morphology. Yeah. <laughs> sure, yes. Yes, morphology. Yes. Um. You're really presupposing in all this segmentation. I mean, you're really depending on, I have a segmentation, and within the segmentation, let me do everything I can. Yeah. Um, but have you thought about loosening that? I mean, I could imagine trying some multiple segmentations and, and getting something out right, of this. Right, right, right. So, OK, so what we're doing right now, there are possibly results right now waiting for me in that meeting, um, um, is really running it on a query task and and there we're for now we're just taking exactly the embeddings that we have and just running them on all segmentations within reason of some database um, if that doesn't work um, and we have reason to believe that it's that it might work because there's that earlier work by Levin et al where they did take some acoustic word embedding they ran them on non word segments and it worked fine um, but if it doesn't then the next step would be to train our embeddings with both word segments, both actual word segments and non-word segments. And that, that might be a more principled way of doing it. I have a question about the multi-view embeddings. I'm wondering how much of what you see is an artifact of the specific language. Do you think in other languages, not English, you would see similar patterns? Um, what kind of patterns? Like the suffix patterns? Some languages don't reflect uh, pronunciation, say, as other languages in the, in the orthography. Right. Yeah, so like for Chinese, it'd be close to hopeless. Um, but for most other languages, it would actually be better. Most of them have an even better match between orthography and phonetics. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I think of English as actually a pretty challenging language for, for what we're trying to do here. Um, OK, and I have to show my last slide um, to thank collaborators again and funders. Um, and I wanted to list the papers in case people want to follow up. And then if anybody actually wants to try anything like this, we have some of our code up. Um, and hopefully, more will be coming soon. Okay.